we're celebrating not only the death and burial of Christ, but the resurrection, for he is risen indeed. Thank you for a Savior that lives and loves in our lives. We'll just commit this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask our elders and deacons that are serving to join me in the front this morning, as is our custom on the first Sunday of each month, we gather around the Lord's table, and uh, the scriptures instructs us to do this in a way that we will not forget the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we will, in the midst of the busyness of life and the distractions that come our way, forget the great sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. As we gather, uh, I'm always reminded that there's nothing meritorious in these elements, uh, these elements do not become anything special, but they represent the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. So as we come to these moments, it's a time of reflection, a time for us to reflect back on that sacrifice Christ has made. It's also a time of examination as we read in the scripture. There are some who did examine their life. There are some who did not. Uh, continue on in their faith and as a result of that they lost their lives and they went to sleep as it says in the scriptures. It's a time for us to examine our lives. Make sure we are the person that God wants us to be. And that's a time of dedication. A time for us upon that reflection to say okay God today's the first day of the rest of my life and I want to live this for you and I dedicate this to you. Please take control of my life and give me, through the power of your spirit, the ability to live a life that's honoring and pleasing to you. So that's what the Lord's Supper is really all about. The Apostle Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he says, For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And what he means by that is this idea of what the bread and the juice represents. He says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For if anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. If we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home. So that is when you meet together. It may not result in judgment. Again, as we mentioned, this is a time for us to reflect back and to remember that sacrifice the Lord has done. Not to take it lightly, to examine our lives, to come before him in a state of confession, and then to anticipate his blessing in the days ahead. As we prepare to receive the bread this morning representing the body that Christ gave, let's pause and ask the Lord's blessing upon Amazing love, how can it be that you would die for me? Lord, we cannot fathom that love. But Lord, we thank you for it that you loved us first. Let us remember that as, as we take this bread that you gave to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
said, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after supper, Christ took the cup. Let's ask the blessing upon the cup at this time. Lord, it's unbelievable. It's how, how we ever comprehend what you've done for us. You shed your blood for us on the cross. You knew what was coming. With all your plans, Lord, uh, help us to uh, reflect back on what we should be like. We should be like Christ, like you. Thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood for us. Believe that. 
You've heard the stories of his life. I know one I've mentioned before, but it's always on my mind when I go to prayer and I think, do I have this kind of faith? But he was a man who built a number of orphanages in England. And he was very compassionate towards the homeless children that came about uh, because of the Industrial Revolution in England. And so he took these children in. And one particular time, it was breakfast at the orphanage, and there was no food, not a crumb in the house. But as was their routine every morning, he gathered the children around the breakfast table, and they paused to thank God for the food that they were about to eat. But there was no food there. But before he could complete his prayer, there was a knock at the door. And upon opening the door, there was a delivery man there who was delivering fresh made baked goods to stores in the next town. But his truck broke down right in front of the orphanage. Now this was back in the late 1800s. There were not, uh, you know, triple A. There was no one for him to call. There were no cell phones. There was no way for him to get a repairman to come and fix the truck. It was going to take a day or so. By then the fresh baked goods would be stale and cold. And so he said, could you use this truckload of fresh goods? And of course God was in it. And God answered their prayers of thanks for the food that they were about to eat that didn't even exist at that time. Arthur Pearson writes, and I'm always a little reluctant to read things. It's hard to follow sometimes. But he writes about George Mueller. And he says this. He says, the teacher must also be a learner. And therefore, only he who continues to learn is competent to continue to teach. Nothing but new lessons, daily mastered, can keep our testimony fresh and vitalizing and enable us to give advanced lessons. Instead of being always engaged in a sort of review, our teaching and testimony will thus be drawn each day from a new and higher level. George Mueller's experiences of prevailing prayer went on constantly accumulating and so qualified him to speak to others, not as a matter of speculation, theory, or doctrinal belief, but a long, varied, and successful personal experiment. Patiently, carefully, and frequently, he seeks to impress on others the conditions of effective supplication. From time to time, he met with those whom his courageous, childlike trust in God was a mystery. An occasionally unbelief secret of misgivings found a voice in the question, what he would do if God did not send help? What if a mealtime actually came with no food and no money to procure it, or if clothing were worn out? and nothing to replace it. And of course we know that's exactly what happened. To all such questions, there was always ready this one answer. To such a failure on God's part is inconceivable. It's quite a statement, isn't it? And must therefore be put among the impossibilities what he's saying, it's impossible for God not to answer prayer. There are, however, conditions necessary on man's part. The supplicant soul must come to God in the right spirit and attitude. For the sake of such readers as might need further guidance as to the proper and acceptable manner of approach to God, he was wont to make very plain the scripture teaching upon this point. And he goes on and he lists five conditions that George Mueller wrote down of prevailing prayer. These things were ever on his mind. And I want to share these as we begin 
this morning. The first thing that Mueller said was that entire dependence upon the merits and meditation of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only ground of any claim for blessing. We have to be entirely dependent upon God. We have to understand that it's God and God alone who answers our prayers. The second thing he said was that separation from all known sin. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us, for it would be sanctioning sin. The third condition of prevailing prayer is that faith in God's word of promise as confirmed by his oath not to believe in him is to make him both a liar and a perjurer. A strong language, isn't it? But this from a man who prayed and thanked God for food when there was none and rose to eat fresh baked food. The fourth condition is asking in accordance with his will. Our motives must be godly. We must not seek any gift of God to consume it upon our own lust. And then importunity and supplication. There must be waiting. Waiting on God and waiting for God as the husbandman has long patience to wait for the harvest. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to be impatient. I think it goes back to my childhood. I remember probably in kindergarten, we were given little Dixie cups with little potting soil in them and a bean seed. Some of you remember doing that in school? We planted that little bean seed in there and every day we would come to school. The teacher had them all along the windowsill there and we would take a little uh, watering can and we'd put a couple drops of water and we'd pass it on and each student would do that and every day we would go to the window and we would just look and we would look and nothing was happening it seems like weeks went on I'm sure it wasn't that long because beans do go grow rather quickly but it seemed like it was forever and then finally a little sprout came up it was awesome you know, they say, you know, watch pot never boils, and sometimes it's like that with the seeds or with, with our prayers. But every day we would go back, and as we would look at that seed, God was doing a work underground, wasn't he? Until the plant came forth. And that's the way it is with our prayers. Pearson goes on to say that Mueller believed that where these conditions do not exist, for God to answer prayer would be both a dishonor to himself and a damage to the suppliant. Well, that's something to think about, isn't it? If God is God and we believe that he is who he is, if we don't believe that he can answer prayer, we're dishonoring him. And we're not really living lives of faith. It's not building faith and trust in God in our own lives. And this morning, I want to take a few minutes and look at another man who I think had the power of God in his prayers, and that's the man Elijah. And of all places to read about Elijah, we read about in James chapter 5, where it says Elijah was a man with nature like ours. What that means is Elijah had feelings. He wanted to be loved and he wanted to love. When he was insulted, he hurt. When he was hungry, he needed food. When he was thirsty, he needed water. He was a human being in its entire form, just like we are. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now that's in James chapter 5. If you'll turn with me now to 1 Kings chapter 17, we have the story of Elijah and his ministry. 
What makes an ordinary, obscure person a powerful weapon in the hands of God? It's prayer. That is the distinctive characteristic of any man or woman who has ever accomplished great things for God. It has always been rooted in prayer. I have a number of books in my personal library on revival. One's called The Flaming Tongue, and I forget, there's, I have three of them. It was a set of books that talk about the revivals through the ages. And what's interesting is every revival that ever took place started with a couple of people praying. And with Christians, not the unsaved coming to Christ, but Christians confessing their sins, getting right with God, and then touching the lives of the unsaved around them. Revivals never started. There's not one revival in world history that ever restarted, started with mass evangelism that's ever been recorded. Not one. It's always been with a couple of people praying. God has changed entire nations through a couple of people going to prayer. In 1 Kings 17, 1, we read this. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, now Ahab is the king of Israel, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now what's interesting here is this does not tell us the prayer of Elijah, but it explains what he had prayed. Pray. And we know he prayed it because it tells us that in James. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. I think it's interesting. It doesn't tell us that in the historical account. It tells us that in the comments of James when he's teaching about prayer. This is what happened. Elijah prayed and he overcame nature. Elijah prayed and global warming took effect. What do what Al Gore would have thought of that? <laughs> but Elijah prayed he was a man like we are a natural man and yet he had the power through his prayers to change nature now just quickly we go through the life of Elijah from actually chapter 16 through 19 of 1 Kings and you know, Elijah went before the king, Ahab, who was a wicked king. In fact, it tells us, if you read about uh, Ahab, that he was more wicked than all the other kings of Israel combined. We'll just categorize him as super wicked. That's who he was. And his wife was even worse. He married Jezebel. She's even become an expression. It describes a wicked woman. Or even wicked circumstances. That's a Jezebel. And so Elijah goes to the king. And what's taking place here is Ahab and Jezebel, they teamed up. She was the daughter of a foreign king. And she brought in her gods, the gods of Baal, into Israel. And she's saying to everybody, it's okay to worship all these gods. Don't worry about Jehovah. And it's okay to be immoral. They set their own moral code up. And Elijah says, that's not what God really wants for his people. And so in order to get your attention and show you that the God of Israel is more potent than the God of Baal, I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to ask him that it not rain. And it didn't rain. That was the power of prayer in Elijah. J.C. Ryle, who's an old-time commentator, wrote, Prayer is the simplest of acts. It is our simply speaking to God. It needs neither learning nor wisdom nor book knowledge to begin it. It needs nothing but heart and will. The weakest infant can cry when he is hungry. The poorest beggar can hold out his hand for alms and does not wait to find words. The most ignored man will find something to say to God if he only has a mind. Andrew Murray, great evangelist of the former century, said the powers of the eternal would have been placed at prayer's disposal. 
It is the very essence of true religion and the channel of blessing, the secret power of life. Charles Spurgeon said, prayers are the believer's weapon of war. When the battle is too hard for us, we call in our great ally, who, as it were, lies in ambush until faith gives the signal by crying out, Arise, O Lord! Prayer is the slender nerve which unleashed the muscles of an omnipotent God. Dr. Paul Billheimer said, Prayer is not begging God to do something which he is loath to do. It is not overcoming reluctance in God. It is implementing, enforcing Christ's victory over Satan. It is implementing upon earth heaven's decision concerning the affairs of men. Calvary legally destroyed Satan and concealed all his claims. God placed the enforcement of Calvary's victory in the hands of the church. He does that through prayer. Matthew writes, whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. You see, ask, believe, receive is God's pattern. It is faith and prayer that are inseparable. In 1 John, John writes, now this is the confidence, or it could be translated faith or trust in God, that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. In other words, we receive those petitions that we have asked. Elijah was a man of passion. Elijah was a man who had the power of God at his disposal because he had faith in God. He actually, like George Mueller, believed that God could do anything. There was nothing impossible for God. Absolutely nothing. But what can we learn about this man of prayer as we track through his life? And just very quickly, thinking of the life of Elijah to highlight some of his stories, we know that after he went to Ahab, or, uh, to Ahab and Jezebel and kind of confronted them, God told him to go out and sit by a brook, by a ravine, and just kind of hang out there. Get away from them. And I'll take care of you. And so he goes out there, and the ravens, God had ravens, actual birds, come bring him meat every morning and every evening. And then he could drink from the water in the brook. And then when the brook dried up, God said, okay, I appreciate your faith in trusting me here. Now I want you to go to this other area of the land, and you're going to find a woman there, and she's going to take care of you. So he goes, and he finds this woman. She was a widow. And he says, you know, the Lord sent me here, and you're supposed to feed me. And she looks at him, and she says, well, here's the deal, Elijah. I have one cup of flour and two spoonfuls of oil, just enough to make one muffin. And that's it. And there's no food in the land because it hasn't rained for three years. And the famine's dried everything up. There's nothing growing. There's nothing to make food out of. And this is it. And my plan is to make our last muffin, split it with my little boy, and then we're going to go over under this tree and just wait and die of starvation. And Elijah says, okay, well, sounds like a plan, but I think God has another plan. I want you to go make your muffin and split it with me. And he says, what God's going to do is make your flour and your oil continue to reproduce itself as only God can do. And you're going to have all the fl uh, flour and oil you need to make bread from now to a kingdom come. So the lady said, okay, well, you're the prophet of God. If you said that's what God says, fine. So she goes and she makes the last muffin. And the next day she goes back in the house and guess what? Her flour bin is full. Her cup of oil is full. Is full and it went on and on and on. But then... Her little boy gets sick and dies. And she says, what am I going to do now? My only son. You brought this upon me. You come in the name of the Lord and now my son's dead. And the compassion of Elijah for this boy is incredible. He goes to the boy in chapter 17. And it says he laid himself across the body of this dead child. 
and three times cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Isn't that incredible? As he cried on to God, he brings back this child from the grave. I mean, who can do that? Who can do that? The story doesn't end there. Probably one of your favorite stories and one of mine takes place in chapter 18 of 1 Kings. It's the dueling prophets. When they finally, you know, Ahab comes face to face and hit with Elijah and really wants to kill him. And Elijah says, now just hold on to your horses. Let's make a deal. You get all of your prophets of Baal and Asherah, the two key gods of the Baals. And you bring them here to Mount Carmel. And so they bring 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And they build an altar and, and they stoke it with their wood and they lay their animals on it. And they cry out to God, the Baals, to rain down fire and nothing happens. And they're sitting there for hours and I think Elijah's kind of taunting them a little bit, you know, a little trash talk. <laughs> You know, maybe you know, I gotta cry a little louder. You know, maybe he's on vacation. You need to call long distance. You know, send him an email, whatever. You gotta get a hold of bail. Have him come down here and light your fire. Nothing's happening. They start slashing their wrists, trying to show bail how serious they are. And so finally, the 850 prophets are done. And Elijah said, "Okay, that's enough." Let's just see what God can do. And so he builds his altar. He puts his wood and his. And a sacrifice on it. And then he says, bring me barrels of water and let's douse this thing with water. They doused it. They had dug a trench all around it like a moat until the moat was full of water and, and the altar was soaked. And he cries on to God. And the God who answers by fire rains down fire and consumes not only the sacrifice, but the altar and, and the ground and the water and the mo and it just choo, wiped it out. So Elijah called upon God. But then, chapter 19, Ahab goes and tells Jezebel what happened, and Jezebel says, oh, let's get that sucker. <laughs> and Ahab says, what? I mean, God, I just did all this cool thing, you know, by your power, but here I am, and they had 850 against one, and we did this great thing, and now they're going to kill me. And so he runs, and he hides. And God finds him and says, what are you doing? He said, well, they're going to kill me. Don't you feel sorry for me? I'm the only one. And God says, well, you might think you're the only one, but I've identified 7,000 others who have not bowed. It's interesting to know that generally when we feel lonely, God has a lot more people around us than we realize. We just kind of suck into ourselves rather than reach out to others. And there's a lesson there, but we're not going to talk about that today. But you know, that's what Elijah did. And so Elijah finally came to his senses. And God forgave him and he went on and met Elisha and passed the mantle of his, of his ministry to Elisha. Interesting. Interesting God. The power of God in the man who, like us, was human. That's the thing that struck me when I read that in James. He was like nature to us. He was an average guy. He really was. You look at First Kings, the story of Elijah, and just all of a sudden, here's this guy from Tishbe that shows up who has the idea that God can do anything, but that's the only thing that's special about him. No special history, no special family, no special heritage, no special education, just that he believed that God could do the impossible. That's the only thing special about him. Well, what do we learn about him? Very quickly, in a couple of minutes, let me wrap this up. Here's some things I think we really need to note about Elijah. Number one, Elijah cared about what God cared about. Elijah cared about what God cared about. God cared about the nation Israel. He cared about the fact that the leadership of Israel had gone into an immoral tailspin, and they were leading the people down the wrong path, and they needed to change their ways. They needed to repent and they needed to get back what God's will and way was for their life. 
God had given them the laws. He had given them policies to live by that would help them function in their culture effectively. And they had abandoned all of those things. But Elijah cared about what God cared about. And he went before the leadership and he said, you know, God's word says we need to change these things. And they said, let's kill them. <laughs> but he cared about what God wanted to care about. What God cared about. You see, God cares about the leadership of nations. He cares about the moral failures of leadership and the example and influence they have on the population. And please do not be misled. We live in a country, it's the greatest country on this earth. But now we have leadership that is approving same-sex marriage. God cares about marriage. One man, one woman, one life. God cares about marriage. Amen. He's ordained it in the scriptures. And yet when leadership says, it's okay, then what did the people say? Well, our leaders, they're very intelligent people, and if they say it's okay, it must be okay. We have this trickle-down effect of morality. We kill 120,000 babies annually. But it's okay. Because these smart people say it's okay. We have people who manipulate to achieve political goals. But it's okay because they're in leadership. We have people who hold political offices and they blame their positions that they have to do things when they're in this office and therefore they're exempt from personal responsibility. And we say, oh, it's okay because they're, they're the leaders. They're smart. They're intelligent. But do we care about what God cares about? Amen. The morality that God has set forth in the scriptures. Amen. The way that he wants nations to run. God ordained civil government. Go back to Genesis chapter 9. God ordained it. And it was to protect people from immorality. Not to approve it. And yet this is where we come today. That's why we have in the word of the Lord in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And you probably know this verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You see, we're not judging people. We're judging sin. There's a distinction. God cares about people. He loves people, whether they're homosexuals or baby killers or adulterers. Or, God loves people. He died for them. But he still wants them to change yes. their behavior to honor him. Elijah cared about what God cared about. Secondly, Elijah had the compassion that got God's attention. Remember when the young boy died? Elijah had been doing great things. And he had prayed. And rain had stopped. And he had prayed. And the woman's flour and oil kept reproducing itself. And now the child died. But he laid his body, I'm trying to picture this, he laid his body over the dead child's body and the word says he cried. It's a passionate, it's a screaming to God. He wasn't just saying, okay, God, now lay me down to sleep, bless this little boy. He was screaming passionately to God to give this child back his life. Have you ever cried unto God? out of heartache, out of fear, out of loss. God's a compassionate God. Elijah had that compassion and he took it before God and God answered his prayers. Thirdly, Elijah changed nature and nations with his prayer and his faith. I think it's just incredible. Weather patterns for three and a half years totally changed. I mean, think about it. 
Think what would have happened to the world today if it didn't rain for three and a half years. We've had droughts the last couple of years, and look at how it's impacted the cost of food. Think of it then rain for three and a half years. The attention of the nation, and that was the whole point of this prayer, was to get the attention of the nation who had totally disregarded God and his word. They thought they had control over their lives. They could do whatever they want. They could run rapid in an immoral culture. And they lived like atheists, like God didn't exist. Elijah prayed, and he said, you think you're in control, but you're not. God's in control. You can't even control the weather. Amen. But God can. Fourth thing is this. Elijah cared less about the opposition and more about the display of God's power. I think how often do we cower in the face of anti-Christian rhetoric? How often do we kind of hide from the opposition, whether it's in the press or in the community or in discussion. God's name is being taken in vain when we stand by. And it's not just maybe a curse word, but it could be the attitude, the spirit of a conversation, a philosophy of life that's being presented and we stand by. I think 850 to 1. <laughs> But, you know, Martin Luther said one man in God is a majority. Elijah understood that. He didn't care so much about the opposition. They were no match for the cries of the man of God. Remember, James goes on and says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Yes. Amen? Amen. See, he didn't care so much about the opposition. He wanted to see God's power displayed. The last thing is this. Elijah was human and he faced the realities of life just as we do. You know, I told you Elijah ran from Jezebel after the dueling prophets thing went on there. God rained down fire from heaven, awesome way, and yet now he's scared. And he runs away and he hides. He was human and faced the realities of life just like we do. I find it interesting that oftentimes in life, Satan brings his tools of discouragement upon us after we've experienced some type of spiritual victory. Satan doesn't want us to bathe in the glory of God. He doesn't want us to be consumed by the power of God that can control our lives to the point where we can totally surrender ourselves to him. He doesn't want that. So as soon as we have a victory, put your antenna up because Satan's going to be there to bring some type of discouragement. And here, in this case, it was a wicked woman, Jezebel. Scared, it, scared Elijah to have to death. But I've been reading through Revelation the last couple of weeks. And I've been journaling about each of the churches. And as I was reading this, I was reminded of the church in Philadelphia where Jesus says to the church there, he says, I know your deeds. I know that you have little strength, but you have kept my word and you have not denied me. No one will take your crown. Isn't that exciting? You see, it's not how big and powerful or what kind of position you have. It's the fact that you are faithful to God, that you keep his word, that you don't deny him, that you will see even in the difficult times of life that God will be faithful to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. God will be faithful to you. No one will take your crown. Because it's not about you. It's about God. Yes. And if we maintain our faithfulness, He's going to maintain our rewards for us. So how do we wrap this up? Five things. Elijah, he cared about the things that God cared about. He exercised godly compassion. We need to continually pray for our nation as he did. He prayed fearlessly, even in the face of opposition. And he realized the enemy's greatest tool is discouragement. So we can't allow that to creep in. 
Judy, do we have that video? I just wanted to play a video as we wrap things up this morning. It's from Jim Cimbala, the Brooklyn Tabernacle. They started their ministry really out of a, a prayer group, a Tuesday night prayer group. And he talks about that as part of a program they have for small groups uh, teaching on prayer. And uh, I want just to share this with you as we wrap things up this morning. Because if someone really believes in God, they instinctively begin to call on the name of the Lord. And that's how religion began. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, we find out this little obscure verse that not many people notice. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. And that's the beginning of corporate religion as we know it. Adam and Eve had fallen in the garden and sinned. And uh, then the descendants of Cain had begun to move away from God. But the descendants of Seth, it is written, began to call on the name of the Lord. They began to sense somehow that this God was not just a creator God, but he was a God who would intervene in life and in the problems that you were facing if you just called on him. And I wish I would have been there at that moment when their first instinct was to look up to God and begin to call out to him and say, God, help us with our harvest. We need rain. Or my baby is sick. Lord, intervene. This God who created the universe, I believe that you can come and now help get back into order that which has become sick and wounded or hurt in some way. And the Bible tells us that that was really the first name of God's people. People who called on the name of the Lord. There was no Bible yet, no churches. Abraham hadn't been born, there was no Jewish people. The law hadn't been given, there was no tabernacle or temple. But people, the first instinct they had was to call upon God. Not only in prayer and petition, but then in worship and in praise. Later on in Deuteronomy, Moses boasts, uh, to the people of Israel. Who is a people like us that is so blessed that has a God who will draw near to us when we call upon him? Later on, David says in one of the Psalms, God has preserved the, the godly for himself. He will hear when I call to him. This instinct is in both Old and New Testament. When we call, God has promised to answer. And this is at the very foundation of religion, that God is a prayer answering God, and we don't have to give up and just give in to fear or give in to hopelessness, but we can bring our hopeless situations to God, and God says, this is how I will glorify my name. When you call, I will answer, and then people will see how great I am and how faithful I am to my people. In just a few hours, this building is going to be filled with people. And among other things, we're going to be praying for God to pour out His Holy Spirit on our lives. And isn't that the great need in your town and community and city? Isn't that the great need in your local church? That the Holy Spirit would come and revive God's work, where sermons would have more impact, where there would be greater love among God's people, more compassion for the world around us that needs Jesus Christ. None of that can happen without the Holy Spirit being manifested in a new and more powerful way. Why don't you take time right now in your small group and begin to pray for a revival, a spiritual renewal, a fresh work of the Holy Spirit in your life, the life of your group, the life of your church, the life of your city. Remember, nothing is impossible with God, and God's ear is open every time we pray. We're going to do that in a few minutes when we move downstairs. But hopefully we have a closing song. We're going to uh, stand and uh, sing one more song together. And uh, then we'll enjoy some fellowship for a few minutes with the birthday folks. And then I encourage you to come and join us downstairs as we uh, call upon the Spirit of God to enter into our hearts and our lives and our church, our community, and our country. 
and do things above and beyond what we imagine or think. Amen? Amen.